Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, particularly in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, today, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the paleoethnobotany subdiscipline, which is the study of re the relationship between humans and plants. It's really closely related to zooarchaeology, uh, which I talk about a lot because that's what I do. Both zoarch and Peabot are they're really kind of optimized when they're used in tandem with each other. Uh, both are concerned with reconstructing diet and food ways and environmental conditions. And uh, but they're, they're looking at very, very different data sets. So Peabot can be broken up into two major categories, the macrobotanical and the microbotanical. The microbotanicals are dealing with pollen samples and silicate structures within plants called phytoliths that uh, are not necessarily unique to each species, but they cluster with, uh, with morphological structures in the plants. The, the pollens do correspond uh, to particular species, so they can be identified very narrowly with microscopes. Yeah, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about these, but pollen records from stable swamp environments, ponds, bogs, these kinds of things, uh, have been used really, really successfully in reconstructing broad scale environmental patterns across particular landscapes. So here's a example from Kupala Pond in the Eastern Ozark sort of region. Now for macro botanicals, we're talking about things like nutshell, burned wood, things that can be recovered from small screen recovery or in most cases, flotation. These materials are going to be affected by the same four biases that I talked about way back in the Zooarchaeology 101 video, but the preservation bias is much more aggressive with these plant remains because um, they don't have those hard structures, like they're in no way as durable as bone. So we pretty much only find them when they have been burned in this sort of Goldilocks zone uh, where they get charred fully, but not burned all the way down to ash where they're no longer identifiable. And most of what actually preserves in this way are these uh, harder dry structures. If you think about things like uh, potatoes, if they get burned, it's going to leave a schmutz stain that's not really identifiable to anything. Uh, leafy greens might can contribute quite a bit to the, the diet at a particular archaeological site, but there's so much water in them that they don't leave any kind of recognizable, identifiable remains. So we have to keep in mind that there are always, um, there's a lot of things that get filtered out of what we can recover based on preservation biases. Even though our resolution is limited by what gets burned, we can still tell quite a bit. So for instance, uh, different wood species are going to burn at different temperatures. So famously, hickory burns at a, at a temperature that's really conducive for cooking and the smoke has a, a pleasant flavor to it. Um, whereas something like willow is going to burn at a low temperature but have very high smoke production. So these tend to be used in things called smudge pits, which can be used to produce a coating on the exteriors of pottery or also as a method of insect repellent, get rid of mosquitoes. Paleoethnobotanists can also see the transition from wild plants to domesticated plants in certain cases. And domestication is a really big issue within the discipline of paleoethnobotany. And it's important to understand what exactly I'm talking about when I say domestication. So by the definition that we use within, within the, that discipline, uh, a plant is domesticated when people are controlling the plant's reproduction to the extent that the plant becomes dependent on humans for its continued survival. So for instance, in the wild, seeds are attached to grasses with a structure called a rachis. And these in the wild are very brittle. They break off easily so that if heavy wind comes through or an animal grazing bumps into them, uh, the seeds kind of scatter and disperse very, very easily. Now, this makes them more difficult to harvest. So 
if a person's out harvesting these wild grasses, the ones that have the least brittle rachises, the more robust rachises, they're going to be easier to collect. And so over generations, just by the nature of them, the rachises on these, on the seeds that get saved and then planted again, become less and less brittle and more and more durable. But that means that in the wild, if they're not being harvested and deliberately planted, then they're not naturally breaking off their stems and, you know, being dispersed on the ground. So it reduces their evolutionary reproductive fitness in a wild scenario. Another uh, inadvertent consequence of saving seeds and planting them is that seeds with thinner seed coats are able to survive in this kind of captive scenario where people are saving them maybe in baskets and, and stashing them until they're ready to plant where if they were subject to the elements in the wild they they wouldn't survive so well and wouldn't be viable to start growing and the the thinning of the seed coat also makes it easier for the uh, seed to germinate and grow so you you have this scenario where these seed coats are really energy expensive for the plant to produce the, these really thick ones so if there's not that selective pressure keeping the seed coats thick then they will naturally start to decrease in thickness over time and so you you ultimately end up with seed coats that get thinner and thinner and thinner not noticeably for a very long time but eventually they get so thin that it becomes easier to get the, the food part out of the seed coat which then is something that can be deliberately selected for some of the other effects are going to be much more obvious like deliberately selecting for larger seeds or more numerous clusters of seeds on an on an individual plant and eventually those traits being selected for will push the genetics of these captive domesticated seed populations to no longer resemble their wild counterparts and it takes a long time for this to happen so by the time you actually start to see these visible indicators of domestication it's already been going on for several generations and this is much more conducive to plants that are annual in their reproductive cycles than it is for things like trees which take you know 30 years sometimes to to produce um viable food resources now as for collecting samples most recovery of paleoethnobotanical material from archaeological sites requires very different methods from what we use to collect basically everything else because they are so small and so hard to to, to see in uh in an excavation context we have developed a method using flotation tanks which are these big sometimes they're actually modified trash cans plastic trash cans where we can dump fill fill samples soil samples and the burn plant material will float to the top and all the other stuff goes through a uh, quarter inch or eighth inch mesh screen down at the bottom so we can just kind of scoop off those materials and separate them out for their specific analysis i should also talk about rare cases of, of dry and waterlogged sites dry contexts like certain caves or deserts will dehydrate the plant remains which preserve them and the same is true of the waterlogged permanently wet environments they prevent anaerobic degradation and in these rare cases we can see things like basketry and textiles that are made of plant fibers that normally wouldn't survive um, some famous examples of this are like at the windover site where these normally perishable materials outnumber the like the stone tools the lithics by a, a ratio of several factors to one. I, I forget if it was like 20 to one or what, but it like overwhelming majority of all of the material culture recovered from Wendover was perishable material. These plant-based uh, and sometimes I think hide-based materials that are destroyed in most contexts. They just don't survive um, the, the test of time. And at uh, the Monteverde site down in Chile also, they've got uh, tent sticks with ropes still tied to them because they were fully waterlogged and kept these organic materials preserved for a very long period of time. Uh, in fact, with, with Monteverde, that one is, I think, 14,000 years old at the 
youngest. It may, it, it's one of the sites that's, that comes up a lot in the pre-Clovis discussion. Um, so these waterlogged sites, though very rare, can provide a lot of information that's usually just not available at most archaeological sites. So that's all I've got for this one. If you have any questions, you can drop those down in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>